Okay, hi again. Um, as you already know, my name is Georges Hirovim. Uh, so I mentioned earlier a little bit about my career. It started back in um, two, uh, like uh, 99 as a hobby, and then I joined uh, NCCA in Bournemouth University to where to my degree. Uh, and then I had a job in London. Basically, I started as an FXDD. Uh, junior FXDD, and then over the years, I sort of like went further up to uh, become a CG lead uh, for films, and later on at Frame Store, I was a CG a CG lead from FX. I went to like a CG lead, and occasionally I supervised uh, a couple of jobs. Uh, I went to shoot and, and so on. So I'm, I'm just gonna play my uh, show reel, which is a little bit out of date, but you'll get an understanding of what I've been up to uh, all these years. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, so that was my sort of like, let's say, professional day job. Uh, but over the years, I've sort of like managed to um, always run my own personal projects uh, on the side. And that's what I'm kind of like sort of like talk about uh, a little bit here. So um, w what I sort of like enjoyed during uh, this journey in visual effects is that the fact that I can, I can take, I can use these uh, highly sophisticated tools uh, from the industry and sort of like use them uh, in my own art practice many times in a slightly different way than what potentially the software was designed to do. Um, and if we think about it, you know, the, the computer graphics and computer animation in general has been developed with a sort of like single goal in mind to essentially recreate reality. Um, and many times I'm thinking like, why should our imagination be limited by reality and not sort of like break free from these constraints and try to use the medium uh, sort of like 
try, try to explore the endless possibilities that the you know the, the medium has to uh, offer, and I sort of like do this in a, in an attempt to like essentially find new aesthetics, things that we haven't seen before, things that are interesting to us. Um, many times, my my work is often driven by curiosity. Uh, sometimes through curiosity for the tool itself. I'm kind of wondering, you know, why, you know, how, how can I use this tool in a different way or how can I put together a couple of different things uh, and so on. But sometimes uh, I use animation as a, again, through curiosity, as a, as a tool to sort of like understand uh, the world around me. And, and uh, the work I'm going to show you later on is sort of like a result of that, which sort of like started as a question of what a what an object sounds like, which is a little bit a uh, weird question. And then at the end of this project, the, what I came up with, sort of like it sparked uh, a bunch of different ideas, which uh, in the end sort of like produced a, a whole series of work. Um, and the work in broad has to do with like digital information and the digital media we use on our daily life. And, and in a way of kind of like, I've noticed that myself, I've almost become like a little bit obsessed with collecting personal data, which sometimes I see as a reflection to our society of like in the recent years, uh, you know, as humans, we try to digitize as much possible of, of the physical world, of the natural world, in an attempt to sort of like uh, process it, analyze it, and, you know, essentially understand and make decisions uh, about our world. Um, so the, the common denominator, let's say, for, for the, the work I'm going to present uh, in a minute uh, is sort of like this sonification process. Like, it's the first time I sort of like uh, dived into that and it kind of like almost came up a little bit accidental while I was learning uh, Houdini and I was like uh, diving into shops, uh, shops. Um, and I kind of like find very interesting this duality of data, the fact that, you know, uh, one data set can represent something, but then it's very easy, very trivial to turn it into something else. So by definition, sonification is sort of like the process where we can take any arbitrary data set and represent it, sort of like generate an audio out of it um, with a, uh, the intention to sort of like better understand this data set. Because through hearing, we are, like the, the, the hearing, we, we can detect uh, min uh, minor frequency changes and patterns. So it kind of like gives us more clues about the data set. And if you're from, not familiar, there is this, maybe you're familiar with this sound, just as, as an example of a sonification process, which hopefully we're never going to have to hear this in reality, but this is like a, a, a geyser um, meter, which sort of like shows us the um, radiation in our environment. Um, again, before I jump into the project, I just want to mention a couple of just highlight a couple of uh, features maybe you're familiar with, maybe not. Uh, so since we're talking about digital media uh, on the computer, um, I just want to briefly say that, mention that um, a, a digital, a, a, anything on the computer, anything we digitize, anything we put on the computer, essentially has to be encoded into numbers, whether it's images or audio or 3D models, anything. Because essentially computers can only understand numbers. That's what they're processing. That's what everything is built upon. So looking at the digital audio, if you open a uh, like an audio file in any application, you zoom right in, you, you, you notice that this sound wave is made out of uh, distinct samples. Uh, and in fact, a typical uh, sound file uh, at high quality um, operates at 48 kilohertz, which means it has 48,000 samples per second for every channel, for the left and the right channel. Um, and it's important to uh, also mention that these values, these numeric values, exist within a range between minus one and one. And it will make sense later on why I'm kind of like bring this up. So similarly, when we examine a digital image, an image itself is made out of a collection of pixels. And every pixel is represented by usually three values, green, uh, uh, red, green, and blue. And depending on the software you're using and the kind of data type you're using, uh, the color values will go between 0 and 1, where 0 is black, 1 is white, and anything between is sort of like gray. And you see in this example, I'm sort of like uh, selecting a scan line of the photo. And on the right, we can see the, the color values for uh, the given pixel. Essentially, we get a list, almost like a spreadsheet, a list of all the 
the pixel on the specific line, and we get the, the color values. But what's very interesting to sort of like see here is the fact that the, uh, this data set, these numbers, is very trivial to like represent them as a, uh, to, to plot them, to put them on a graph. And essentially, that becomes uh, a signal. We can see it as a, as a signal. And you can see as the line sort of like moves through the image, we can almost identify the, the silhouette of the color values, let's say. Like, it's sort of like a signature of that uh, scan line. Um, moving on, in uh, 3D geometries, typically a polygonal geometry is made out of a collection of points. Um, I mean, in reality, to build a topology, you need a bunch of other information of how you, you, you structure the topology. But uh, in this instance, I'm only interested in, in, in the points. I'm only looking at the point coordinates. And uh, if we look, essentially, every point consists of three coordinates, x, y, and z, which is what we see on the right. And then uh, what's interesting to see, take, take these values again and plot them along their point uh, indices. Um, and all of a sudden, we kind of like see this visual representation of this data, which it's not so much, it doesn't resemble the object itself, but it kind of, again, it's sort of like this uh, signature, this sort of like layout, but it is related in, in a way indirectly with the geometry that we're examining. And it's interesting because depending on how the, the geometry was built, uh, the pattern may be slightly, may be different. Uh, for example, if it's something, if it's a model that's been generated procedurally, usually the algorithm will uh, lay down the points in a, in a logical manner. So we, we're able to detect some kind of pattern or some kind of repetition in this signal. But if we examine something a little more organic, like uh, something that has been modeled by hand or something that has been digitized, uh, this, this signature may be completely arbitrary, can be more random, and so on. And in fact, something else to, to highlight is that within the computer, it doesn't really matter in which order you store these points. You can go, you can start from one end to the other end, or it can be mixed, it can be randomized, and the object will always look the same, but internally on the computer, that information may be stored uh, in a different order. So when we look at the high resolution model, uh, this one probably has probably like around a quarter of a million points. Um, we see the full graph at the bottom left and a, a smaller detail on the bottom uh, right. And it's sort of like a, the, the process I'm taking to, to turn this geometry into audio now, uh, I have to take like a few steps. I'm not actually manipulating, I'm not actually editing the audio itself. I'm just I just need to like conform the data in order to be able to uh, turn into audio. And the first thing I need to do is to sort of like normalize this value. So you see the coordinates may be all over uh, the place. Uh, they can be arbitrary. So in this case, they start from like minus 50 all the way to 200. So the first thing is I have to do is to like compress these values, sort of like refit them uh, and bring them within that minus to one, minus one to one scale, so I can output them to the audio card, which will then drive the speaker so I can listen to the audio. So that's the first thing. The, uh, the next decision I have to make is to essentially how do I map the three channels, the three coordinates uh, into two uh, audio channels. So it's sort of like a decision. Sometimes I may choose X coordinates for the left channel, Y coordinates for the right channel. Sometimes I will mix and match different channels. And basically, I experiment and I uh, experiment with a different approach and see what uh, uh, sounds better to get like more depth out of that audio. And the last, the last sort of like decision I have to make is how fast I read this information. Uh, going back to the audio file, like a high quality audio file is usually 28, uh, sorry, 48,000 uh, samples, which means that if um, in this case I have like a quarter of a million points. Essentially, if my animation needs to be at 30, per, 30 frames per second, if I do the division 48,000 divided by 30, I get about uh, 1,600 samples per second, which means that on every frame of my animation, I have to take 1,600 points and do this manipulation and send them to the uh, sound card to listen what it sounds like. So that's kind of like a little bit of the theory. Now I'm going to show you the first project that I did having this sort of like question in mind how, how an object sounds like. And I have sort of like a case study. Uh, yeah, there we go. We like a, a bunch of different geometries and see what that sounds like.
and in the beginning of every clip, I sort of like indicate these decisions how I sort of like chose to do. And it's interesting as a process because essentially I was using um, Houdini to model geometries to essentially model the sound. And then I switch to uh, 3D scans. And the last one. Right on. So I was pretty happy with the result, and actually this uh, this work picked up a little bit, and uh, it was screening a number of festivals around the world, including Ars Electronica. And then, so I thought, you know, I should take this idea further. And the next sort of like experiment I did was kind of similar, but not quite. In this case, I um, I used the um, you may be familiar with like Google Maps. There's this option for the timeline. It can 
uh, start recording wherever you go in the world. I mean, I'm sure they do it regardless, but uh, if, you, if you enable it, essentially it gives you access so you can download this data yourself. So when I moved to New York, it was the first time I bought a smartphone and I enabled that. So I have data of myself that uh, while I've been in New York for the past seven, eight years, and sort of like decided to like put them in Houdini and see how that translates both visually, but also uh, uh, sonically. Uh, So you see here, every render frame represents a day of my life. So you can clearly see my commute between Brooklyn, home, and Soho, when I used to work at Frame Store. You can see the occasional trips, but most of my life is between home and work, as you see. At some, at some point, you may detect that I'm, I moved houses. Uh, Towards then, you'll also see the, the pandemic. COVID. I, I need to update this with the latest couple of years, but uh, it's coming. It's a, it's a work in progress. So, uh, uh, okay, so next one, exactly the same idea, but in this case, instead of tracking myself, I actually wrote a little software in, in processing to record my mouse position. So I took this uh, application with me in one of the studios uh, I was working at the time, and I, I, and I let it record for an entire week. So essentially, through this animation, you can uh, get an idea of how productive I was during that uh, week. So essentially, here you see the two monitors and how I'm actually moving the mouse or the Wacom tablet. You can just about distinguish the menu buttons at the top and maybe the timeline at the bottom. But you can also tell you how, how often I would take breaks, go to meetings. That was my Monday. And Tuesday. E equally. Anyway, we're not going to go through the whole week, but you get the idea. Uh, next. Oh, OK, so next, I have like a series of other projects. Again, similar using the sonification technique. Uh, I'm just going to run a little bit quicker through all these different projects. So the first one, uh, spam, again, as I said, I kind of like, like to collect some of my personal data. Sometimes I, I feel myself as a digital hoarder. Uh, so one day, I sort of like gathered about a month's worth of uh, spam curious to what they will sound like. And as you'd expect, is equally they're equally annoying. OK, enough. Uh, the next one, actually, I, I really like the next one. So with this one, I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with like test renders. Uh, over the past five, six years, I got to the habit of, uh, instead of deleting, throwing them away, as a work in production, I will keep these images on the side, and I make have a big folder with like thousands upon thousands of test frames, which essentially, again, is sort of like a proof of my process. Um, and I really like this idea. It's, uh, it's as if this is like the byproduct of the production itself. It's sort of like what's left behind, and. Nobody's meant to be looking at these images. This is something that we uh, 
Uh, we look once, we make, we tweak our scene, and then we discard. And I, I, I like to see the analogy with, um, let's say, a carpenter, where after a day's worth in the studio, day's worth wor of work in the studio, at the, at the end of the day, the carpenter may have to clean the, the, all the wood chips and sort of like throw them away for the next morning to go back in and uh, start from start fresh. And I sort of like like this aesthetic of like incomplete renders. Some of which are like even with not enough samples, just depending on what I was building at the time, what I was tweaking uh, at the moment. So nowadays, instead of asking for like sorry results, I ask for my test renders from the different studios. Uh, but yeah, this is going for a while. I'm gonna let it run. Uh, I think it was on for like another five minutes, but you sure like get the idea. And uh, in fact, yeah, if you're if you're interested, like these are the links if you wanna go to my website and see the full work. Uh, moving on, the next one I did it for a festival, um, sort of like a side project, sort of like a gorilla teaser. I did for a festival to get a free pass uh, called Day for Night. Uh, it happened three years in Texas, uh, but I got hold of the of a lighter scan they did of the of the uh, of the building. It was hosted in a, uh, in the old uh, post office in, in Houston. Similarly, a friend of mine used the lighter scan to capture a dance party, which I find very interesting because normally you use laser scanners for static objects, uh, but scanning a dancing crowd sort of like gives this uh, interesting quality of uh, sort of like people appear as ghosts just because they were not in a one place. What's the, the next one? The next one uh, is also using a photogrammetry of a cloud. Uh, I found this video online where a plane flew right around a cloud and it was the perfect tool as for doing photogrammetry. And yeah, again, sort of like the gag of creating a point cloud out of a real cloud. And the last one of this, this series, uh, in this instance, I downloaded a bunch of data from um, a NASA satellites. There are like three satellites that are constantly observing Earth for forest fires, but also any kind of like intense uh, heat sources. So again, here, every frame of the animation represents a day of the calendar. You can see the day at the bottom left, uh, and essentially, it gives us uh, a good understanding of the yeah the state in the world right now, where uh, forest fires is sort of like a uh, a daily reality for many places. Um, and as I was saying earlier, it's sort of like one of the the powers of animation. Like it's very easy to visualize data, but also through sound, you can also detect some patterns, some fluctuation, and especially through the uh, the the season changes. You can also see the fires are like moving up and down uh, in like higher elevations. And I tried to place the camera in, in, in areas that were heavily affected during specific uh, periods, like in Australia that I saw earlier. And there's a moment in, in California when there were like the, the big fires in California like a couple of years ago.
in the very last project I want to talk, I'm going to move away from uh, 3D. I mean, actually, it does have some 3D, but like move away from Houdini. Uh, actually, I forgot to mention all the previous projects were, were made in Houdini, with the exception of uh, Spam and the, the one with the images, the, um, the test renders, where I did them in uh, Touch Designer. But th this one, it's sort of like an installation. It's still a uh, work in progress. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a screen that's hanging from the ceiling. And I'm using a Raspberry Pi like computer, just in Nano. Um, and in combination with an orientation sensor to show like understand where the screen is in space. So let's see this video. So using the sensor, um, I feed that into the computer, and I wrote a, an application in Open Frameworks. It's a C++ uh, framework, uh, and basically I kind of replicated the, uh, the installation, but also w where the screen is moving in space. And once I have the coordinates in the space, essentially the screen acts as a slice within some volumetric shapes. Uh, so I render this slice on the screen, which essentially is like an intersection between, let's say, the physical and the digital world. And then I take th this rendered image and essentially turn it into audio, which creates this uh, sound that is in perfect tune with the motion of the pendulum. Right on, and that's all I had to say today. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I'm I'm waiting for the Ableton Live plugin to come out, the <laughs> VST, so I can play around with that. That's wicked. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about this project? Yeah. Yeah. We'll start up here. Um, amazing, amazing work. Thank you. How do you determine the sonic uh, samples to associate with the data in terms of the actual sounds? It's a direct, uh, I just use the same, exactly the same numbers and ask the computer to treat it as an audio, really. So in Houdini, you can like, using chops, you can bring in the geometry, you can manipulate it a little bit, and then you can either output it straight to the audio card or save it out as a WAV file. But uh, any application that can go as low level as Houdini, whether it's Touch Designer or through programming, where you have wherever you have access to the raw data of, and it's a very easy process to do. You just take the same data, you 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 remap them, and then you send them to the audio card. So there's no sampling per se or synthesize synthesizer like the geometry is the actual uh, representation of the audio. Great work. Thank you. Uh, never thought about using a fax machine to transfer models. So I guess this is a new era for pipelines. Yeah. Um, just curious, are you doing any pre-processing? Uh, are you creating any novel data, any specific data structures that you're using? I know the topologies were all based on variables. Uh, no, I, I mean, the projects in Houdini are just like, I, I, again, using chops, I just take the geometry data and turn them into the audio. So th th there's not really any other processing other than just uh, scaling down the values and making these decisions that I explained earlier. Um, yeah, it's just a direct conversion, really. Uh, I don't know why, but I'd be so curious to see it in reverse, too. Like taking a synthesizer, playing a note, and seeing what geometry it would form. Yeah, this is, I've heard this many times, but unfortunately, going from, I believe audio has like less information than yeah. 
the 3D representation show, you have to like generate something, you have to make up data or you have to make some decisions of how do I represent it. What you're asking essentially is like the oscilloscope where you see the sure. frequencies going up and down. Uh, how you expand this to like a 3D model, yeah. uh, you have to take more decisions and liberties to like do that. Awesome. So this was awesome. And uh, I was just curious, have you ever messed with like theremins and tried to like see if you could use, you know. No, I'm familiar the with them, but like, I've never actually tested one in, uh, for real. Because when, when you had it traveling down like that spiral, mm -hmm. it actually changed like through the harmonic series. So you could like actually hear it changing pitch. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you were to like, like somehow, you know, get that information that could sort of bridge the gap between like an actual physical I don't know how familiar you are with the theremin, but the, uh -huh. you basically, you know, move your arm and, and change I mean, space. I haven't tried that and I, I never had like any experience with the actual instrument, but something I kind of forgot to include in my presentation and maybe I should have uh, the, the Geophone. I actually have a, a version of it, which is sort of like a live performance. I built the same setup in Touch Designer and using a MIDI controller, I was, uh, I'm able to like trigger the different objects. So I have like, it's a presentation of like six different objects and then I can like trigger them at different times. So. Uh, it, at the time, a few years ago, I did like, it was only like a couple of minutes performance, but I, I want to spend more time and actually make it maybe like, you know, 20, 30 minutes uh, performance. And I think that, that would be like, probably like my next step. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again so much. That was super, super cool. Great. I really Th enjoyed it. Thank that. you so much for the opportunity. Yeah.